In the book of Matthew chapter seven, Jesus in his word tells of a man who wanted to build a house. But this man didn't care where his house was built. He felt no need to inspect its location or examine its foundations. And the spot he chose was a lovely spot located by the sandy side of a lazy stream. But because his house was not built on a strong foundation, said Jesus, when the rains descended and the angry winds blew, it was only then that his carelessness and misjudgment were laid bare. It was only then that his miscalculation was exposed and the damage from not building on a firm foundation was revealed. Now, as long as there were no storms, all was well. As long as there were no high winds and floods, all was fine. As long as there were no gales and tempests, everything was pleasant. But when the storms came, because the house was not built upon a rock, said Jesus, the house crumbled under the pressure of the violent winds and driving rains. The house, said Jesus, fell into a pile of ruin and great was the fall of it. But then there was another man, said Jesus. This man understood that the continuum of life is punctuated by the unexpected, by the unpredictable. He understood that life is filled with storms you cannot anticipate. It is filled with downpours you cannot predict. It might be a diagnosis from a doctor you never expected, a phone call from the police that wrecks your otherwise tranquil world. And because he understood that, this man believed in the wisdom of prudence and preparation. He was the kind of man who believed in being better safe than sorry. The kind of man who believed that while you hope for the best outcome, you prepare for the worst case scenario. And so this wise man, said Jesus, built his house upon a rock. And when the storms arrived and the heavy rains came, this man's house stood strong, safe, secure, and steady. I think it was Henry Ward Beecher who once said, a cobweb is as good as the mightiest cable as long as there is no strain on it. My friends, for the next few moments, I would like to speak to you as a pastor who in a few weeks, God willing, I will be entering my 20th year pastoring the church where I am today, the Palm Bay Seventh-day Adventist Church. And for the next few moments, I want to speak to you as a pastor who over the years has gone deep into the vaults of the study of God's word. This is not a guest speaker type of sermon I'm about to preach. This is a sermon birthed out of years of prayer and perspective, a sermon born out of the depth of years of spiritual thinking and years of being stretched and guided by the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you that from my study of the scriptures, my study of the spirit of prophecy, and my study of Christian history, I believe God has shown me that throughout the centuries, the most neglected work of the Christian church has been building and growing people who have character that resembles, reflects, and reveals the character of Christ. My study has shown me that we have been more focused on building bigger churches and not better people. You see, to many leaders of the Christian church for hundreds of years, they've been more focused on real estate and cash flow than on preparing the souls of men and women for the arrival of Jesus. We have prioritized what we felt we could monetize, and we could not see an obvious way to monetize the building of people with Christ-like character. God showed me that most Christian churches and denominations have been focused on the three B's. The first B is believing. Our idea of evangelism and discipleship is getting people to believe what we believe. The second B is belonging. We've been focused on getting people to join our church and our denomination. We understand clearly how getting more people to join is good for the bottom line. The third B is behaving. We focus on teaching the norms and rules of the faith so that people can comport and behave. And for heaven's sake, do not embarrass us and sully the brand. Down through the centuries, almost all Christian churches and denominations have not been focused on the last B, becoming. 
becoming like the character of Christ. And my study has helped me see that down through the centuries, the Christian church has continually and consistently miscalculated. And we have neglected, like the foolish man Jesus spoke about, we have neglected to build the church on the rock. And what is this rock of which I speak? I believe the rock upon which the church has neglected to build is the rock of Christ-like character, the rock of Christ-likeness and becoming like the character of Christ. Becoming like the character of Christ has not been the central focus of our teaching and living. Almost no Christian denomination has Bible studies on it. Almost no Christian denomination has as its central teaching, preaching focus, growing and teaching Christians to be more like the loving character of Christ. Becoming like the loving character of Christ has not been the first of our fundamental beliefs or first among our theological essentials and imperatives. And as a result, throughout Christian history, the Christian church has been plagued by a disease I call Christians with unchristlike character, unchristlike attitudes, temperament, disposition. Throughout history, the world has had to endure the shocking savagery and cruelty of people who call themselves Christian, church going, hymn singing people who were involved in slavery and human trafficking, or Christians who hire political leaders to be mean to other people on their behalf while they look the other way. Christians who are not Christ-like are not building the church upon a rock. They are building their church on shifting sand. Christians who are not like the loving character of Christ in character are doing the greatest damage to the cause of God and earth. How terrible it is, says the servant of the Lord, for any who bear his name to give to the world through a defective character, a distorted image of Christ. They are constantly stumbling blocks to other people. She says the savior never suppressed the truth, but he uttered it always in love. In his intercourse with others, he exercised the greatest tact and he was always kind and thoughtful. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave unnecessary pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He never made truth cruel. What a word from the servant of the Lord. He never made truth cruel, but he always manifested a deep tenderness for humanity. Every soul was precious in his sight. He bore himself with divine dignity, yet he bowed with the tenderest compassion and regard to every member of the family of God. He saw in all souls whom it was his mission to save. I believe that is why God inspired the Apostle Paul, the prophet of Christocentric thinking and living, to write these words of unusual precision and clarity found in Colossians 1 verse 27. The word of God says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, those words. Momentous, insightful, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What do they really mean? They mean Christ's character living in us. It is not optional for the Christian. Neither is it to be a sporadic, erratic, convenient display. It is not an alternative option for professing Christian. Christ in you is the only acceptable path God allows for the Christian. What do those words mean? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, I preached this scripture many ways. I proclaimed it to mean his spirit in you, his mind in you, his words and principles in you, his example lived out in you. But today I come before you to declare my clearest understanding of this scripture. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul calls it a glorious mystery. 
that the character of Christ could live in me, in my character. It is the miracle of miracles and the only rock upon which the church can build successfully. Today, we have fused those two words, Christ and character together. And the new word for Christ's character in us is Christ-likeness. The Sermon of God says, if we are Christians, it will be manifest in Christ-likeness of character in our works, in our words, in our home, in our association with others. It will be evident by our patience and long-suffering and kindliness. To put it simply, to be a Christian means to be Christ-like. And if it is not Christ-like, it is not Christian, period. No ifs, ands, or buts, no excuses. And we have here Paul telling us something that we as Christians have been slow to hear and slow to learn. And that is Christ's likeness is the only rock, the only foundation upon which the church can build effectively. The church cannot build successfully on the lives of Christians who are unchristlike in character. Any foundation other than Christ-like character is shifting sand. 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no other foundation, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. My friends, every truth we teach, including the Sabbath, if it does not transform our character into an image of the likeness and character of God, we are lifting and building on shifting sand. Ask the Pharisees. They kept the Sabbath. They revered the law. But they rejected the character of God and the character of Christ. And unless you build the church on the character of Christ, you are not building upon a rock. All the strides we've made is an Advent movement. If our church members are not growing in Christ-likeness and Christ-like character, we are building on shifting sand. Without Christ-like character, every truth we believe, every prophecy we proclaim, every theological interpretation we advance is still building on shifting sand. And if you don't believe me, ask Ellen White. She says it this way. If the truth we profess to believe does not change the heart and transform the character, it is of no value to us. It is not possible to receive and obey the words of Christ without having the character conformed to the likeness of Christ. Church without Christ-like character, our reputation as a church it's not built on a rock. It's built on shifting sand. And we cannot, should not, and dare not believe that because we are God's special people, that he will excuse us from this divine requirement that to be a Christian means to be Christ-like in character all day, every day, no excuses. And as a pastor, I must tell you, I didn't always understand this. For my own life, I didn't always understand this and I was not safe, even as a pastor from being rejected by Christ. I was not safe from being lost and hearing Jesus say to me, depart from me, I never knew you. I couldn't say I didn't know better, I read the word of God, neither could I say I didn't know enough. I just had not embraced this central truth of Christianity. And until I understood this truth, I was lost. So when God says Christ, his character and work is the center and circumference of all truth. He is the chain upon which the jewels of doctrine are linked. In him is found the complete system of truth. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The fullness of truth is Christ in you, this is the rock upon which the church is built. Anything else we build without his character is shifting sand. The, the great academic and health institutions we have built without Christ-like character, it's all shifting sand. After all, there are denominations who are richer than we are, have built bigger, better, and larger organizations than we have. But without Christ-likeness, it doesn't matter how big and popular or rich a ministry might be, without Christ-like character, all of it is shifting sand. 
the billions of dollars we have accrued as a denomination, all the wealth we hold in our banking institutions without Christ-likeness in the heart and character of our people, all of it is shifting sand. Money never made any church rich. Only Christ-like character can make a church truly rich. That's why God says in Micah 6, 7, and 8, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then verse 8, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? to act justly and to love mercy. Character, love justly, character, love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. It is character that is most important to God. She says it this way, it is a moral, it is moral worth that God values a Christian character unblotted with avarice, possessing quietness, character, meekness and humility, character. These are more precious in God's sight than the most fine gold. I remember doing a concert in a church in Dallas, Texas, and the pastor took me into the sanctuary to show me their new $3 million organ. You heard me, their organ cost $3 million, more than my church sanctuary building. But friends, even a church built with a three billion dollar organ without Christ-like character and Christ-like people, that church is not built on a rock. Multi-million dollar ministries without Christ in you in the hope of glory is building on shifting sand. Because you see, the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan. And what is the redemption plan? It is the restoration in the human soul of the image and character of God. That is what redemption is. That is what redemption means. The redemption plan is the restoration of the image and character of God in man. The character of God in you and me. But we have bifurcated and separated rescue from restoration. And so for most of the Christian church, redemption has come to mean just rescue. Rescue for the penalty from the penalty of sin and no longer is the restoration of the image and character of God seen as part of the redemption plan that Jesus came to earth to do, to restore the moral image of the character of God in us. And throughout Christian history, the Christian church has been cheating the world by teaching and preaching what I call an incomplete gospel, a gospel of rescue without restoration. It is an incomplete gospel. While the church in comparison, says Ellen White, while the church in comparison with past years has made some advance, yet in comparison with what she should be, in comparison with the great sacrifice made in Gethsemane and on Calvary, she is far behind in the most important work ever given to mortals. And what is that work? Listen to what she says. Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. So did you hear that? The most important work ever given to mortals, the church, even though it's done well, is far behind. And what is it? What is that most important work? She says, character building is the most important work. The image of God restored in the soul day by day, strengthened, renewed, reflecting and revealing and the character of Christ. Redemption that does not include the embrace of Character growth and character building is a rejection of what Christ came to do, what he died for. He died not just to rescue you, but to restore you, to see you grow more every day, to resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of God. 
And this truth of rescue and restoration as being redemption is the rock on which the church can build successfully. Anything else is shifting sand. And after more than 50 years of preaching, I want to say to you like the late Dr. John Stott, a great man who said, before I retire and end my ministerial pilgrimage, I would like to tell you theologically where my mind has come to rest after all my teaching, preaching, writing, all my sermons. He said, it is simply this. God wants his people to become like Christ. Christ-like character, Christ-likeness. It is the will of God for the people of God. Oh friends, all our sterling achievements as a denomination will not stand the test of time if we're not building on the rock of Christ-likeness. One day I flew to Australia to do a camp meeting and as I got up to speak, I said, I've come a long way to make a simple case for the preeminence of Christ likeness. And I stand here today before you as a preacher of almost 50 years, condensing my faith as one word, Christ likeness. You see, whether we realize it or not, every day, all of us are building an eternal house. And we are building not just for this world, but for the world to come. But we have been trying to prepare the world for the second coming and the return of Jesus to the earth. And we've had very little emphasis on preparing our characters to return with Jesus to glory when he comes. Did you hear me today? We've been so focused on telling people about his arrival, we've neglected to place sustained focus on our own character preparation to depart and leave with him when he returns to glory. Friends, Jesus is coming back to earth, but he's not staying long. As a matter of fact, when he comes, he's not touching down. My Bible tells me those who are clothed in his character, those who resemble, reflect, and reveal his character will be caught up with him to meet the Lord in the air and return with him to meet the Father in the holy city. The Bible says Jesus will then Bring with him to glory all those whose characters are prepared for residence in the kingdom of heaven. So more important to you than the return of Christ for you is whether or not your character is prepared to leave with him when he returns to glory. And no man can say what state of readiness of character is acceptable to God. That's his call. That's why he is God and no one else. But he's told us that to live eternally in the heaven with the angels, we must embrace for time and eternity his gift of restoration and character growth. Throughout eternity, we are going to be growing and learning to be more like the character of Christ. Now, many may ask the question, can we really ever in our characters be ready and prepared for eternity here? The answer is no, not on our own. On our own, we will never be really completely ready, but God still wants us to do our best to be ready. And I love it. The servant of God says, when we do our best, he becomes our righteousness. Not we become our righteousness. He becomes our righteousness when we do our best. Preparation for eternity, she says, should be the first and only real work of our lives. But God has called us. He's called us to preach and teach the truth of his second coming. But we cannot stop there. So the Lord tells us for Christ, his character is the center and circumference of all truth we teach. His character is the chain upon which all the jewels of doctrine are linked. And so if we preach and teach doctrinal truths and neglect to tell people that the character of Christ is at the center and circumference of all the truth we teach, 
We are not teaching and giving proper emphasis on what God wants us to do. We are not building on that rock of Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are not building on the one essential thing we need for our entrance into his kingdom, and that is Christ-likeness. Did you know the characters formed in this life will determine the future destiny? The character building you do now will determine your eternal salvation or your eternal ruin. That's why, that's why the enemy is always seeking to divert the minds of old and young from the great work of character building. And we must begin our character building on the word of God. And get this, I love this. She says in all the instructions of Jesus, in everything Jesus taught, he presents before us the character of God. That means all through the word of God, the character of God is being taught. The fruits of the spirit, they are teaching us about the character of God. Love, joy, that's God's character. Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are dimensions of the character of God. And when the life of Christ is in you, she says, you will produce those same fruits of character that are living in the character of Christ. The Sermon on the Mount, those principles are dimensions of the character of God. Meekness, there's character, pure in heart, peacemaker, merciful, all those represent Christ-like dimensions of character we must have if we are to resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of God. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, God gives us his divine plan for the development of Christian character, faith, virtue, moral goodness, integrity, knowledge of God's character and his will, self-control, patience, kindness, holiness, and love. Oh, these are but a few of the infinite dimensions of the character of God. And I will share with you a key God gave to me. Whenever you study in the word of God, you see dimensions of character. God says, I want you to have these. Just remember this. Whatever God asked you to be, he already is. And he is so in perfection. God would never ask you to be what he's not. Whatever he asked you to be, that's his character. He would never ask you to become what he has not promised you, the power you need to become. Praise God. God wants us to begin removing brothers and sisters. Now, all defects of character here on earth that we have now, that's not what heaven is for. Heaven is not for us to start removing deficits of character. In other words, she says, the precious hours of probation we have are granted that we may remove every defect from the character. And just as a defective link in a chain makes the chain worthless, a defect in your character will unfit you to enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, my friends, if we are defective in character, we cannot pass the gates that mercy has opened to us. We cannot pass through those gates. It is because if God's mercy, she says, opened the gates of heaven to the whole human race, regardless of character, there would be a worse rebellion in heaven than before Satan was expelled from heaven. If we went to heaven with defective characters, we would start a rebellion. Brothers and sisters, if we are serious about going to heaven, we need to focus on character preparation and character growth now. Not because character building earns you a ticket into the kingdom. It does not. The way I see it, character growth and character building is simply how we express our gratitude to God for rescuing us from the power and penalty of sin. Yes, character building is how we express our gratitude to God for his gift of redemption, which includes rescue and restoration into the likeness and character of God.
For friends, if we should die, the same way we go down is the same way we are coming up. You know, some people actually see themselves going to the grave angry and coming up on resurrection with a sweet, loving, saintly disposition. That's not how it works. <laughs> you cannot go to the grave mean. You cannot go to the grave, the grave annoyed and easily irritated and expect to come up out of the grave with a sweet, saintly smile. We will not go to heaven with any defective characters. The characters we have built through the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, those are the characters. The characters that the Holy Spirit has helped to impart to us. And the, we need the Holy Spirit to help us. Character is not a do-it-yourself project. You need the help of the Holy Spirit to change your character. What we must never do is make excuses for not building character like the character of Christ. Satan is happy, jubilant, when he hears us making excuses for our defects of character or when we make excuses for the deformity of character for our favorite politicians and heroes, making excuses for them, you know, I want you to know defects of character have created generations of theologically trained, biblically literate monsters, moral monsters. God longs to see his children not only know his will, but reveal a character after his likeness and similitude. Too many people today are building on the shifting sands of popularity and influence. They're building on the shifting sands of applause and praise. They are building on the shifting sands of philosophy, speculations, and conspiracies and opinions. They're building on the shifting sands of intellectual pursuits and moral attainments. Some are building on the shifting sands of wealth and earthly honor, and it's so sad when they realize when the storms of sorrow come, when the floods of trial and trouble beat upon the house, only the house that's built on the rock of righteous character will stand. When the storms of tribulation and affliction beat upon the house, only the house that is built on the rock of Christ-like character will be safe. When the floodwaters of grief and sadness threaten your house and the storms of sadness and danger loom over your house because you built your house upon a rock, you will be safe. Years ago on the East Coast, there was a boy who spent many hours during the summer on the shore and near the beach. He had a gift of creating intricate and creative sandcastles. He knew how to create whole cities just out of the sand on the beach. Well, one year for several days in a row, he was bothered and bullied by some other boys who would push him around and kick in and smash all the sandcastles he had spent hours making. Finally, he thought he would try an experiment. He wanted to do something that would keep those boys from bullying him and kicking in his sandcastles. So he decided this time when he built his castles, he would place concrete rocks, cinder rocks as his foundation. And then he built his sand kingdoms on top of the rocks. Well, you can imagine what happened. When the local bullies came and they saw, he, he actually saw them coming, he ran off, he got out of the way and he hid behind a sand dune not far away so he could watch and see what would happen. Well, those bullies got a running start and they swung their bare feet to kick down his sand castles and I don't have to tell you what happened next. All that boy heard was cries of pain and voices howling in agony and misery. But from then on, he never saw those bullies again. All because he built his house on a rock. Church, the devil is a bully. He wants to hurt, maim, and destroy. He's a bully. He wants to disfigure your character, deface God's image and likeness in your life. 
But when you build your house on the rock of his righteous character, God's righteous character, when you build your house on the rock of Christ in you, the hope of glory, you need not fear his harassment. You don't have to worry about his threats and persecutions because you built on the rock of his life and character. You need not fear his hounding. You need not fear his torment or tyranny because you built your house on a rock. You need not fear his terror because when he kicks at your house, when he kicks at the house of your character, because you have built on the rock of Christ in you the hope of glory, you will be safe. When he tries to kick in your door, he is the one who will howl in pain. And as the old folks used to say, Jesus will make your enemies leave you alone. The rock of faith is the living presence of Christ in your life. And if you build on the rock, if you build on that rock, you will be safe. And in that glorious day, when our warfare against darkness is over, because we built on the rock of Christ's character, we who sow in tears shall reap in joy. We shall march through the flood and the flames, waving branches of victory in our hands because we built on the rock of Christ's character. We shall come up from every side of the earth, from the north and south, east and west. We're going to come up carrying our crosses, weeping our tears, and going home with him as a bride adorned for her husband. And he will take us to a land, a land where flowers never fade and the day never dies. Oh, my friend, today, if you would like to build your future, your eternal future, on the rock of Christ living in your character, I invite you to pray with me right now. Father in heaven, thank you for this revelation that Jesus Christ in us, his character in us, is the rock upon which we can build. His character is the rock upon which we can build successfully. Keep us faithful and keep us ever building on the rock of Christ in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen and amen.